I'm Claudia Yaroubi, Roshan Associate Professor and Coordinator of Persian Studies at the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at UNC Chapel Hill. I'm delighted to be here with you today for our third panel of our symposium titled Revisiting Discourses of Love, Sex, and Desire in Modern Iran and Diaspora. Please feel free to ask your questions using the Q&A button on your screen to post your questions for the panelists. And please um, use the name of the specific panelists you, you want to address your question to. Our moderator will ask as many of your questions as possible uh, from the speakers. I would also like to remind you that um, next Saturday, October 3rd, at the same time at 12 p.m. Eastern time, we are going to have our uh, wrap up roundtable. So do not forget to um, attend that one too. Before I hand it to our moderator today, I would like to thank our co-sponsors, the American Institute of Iranian Studies, UNC Persian Studies Program, the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, Duke UNC Consortium for the Mid Middle East Studies, the Center for the Study of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies, Associate Dean of Arts and Sciences, Associate Dean of Global Affairs, the Departments of English and Comparative Literature, History, Religious Studies, Women and Gender Studies, and Geography, the Institute for the Arts and Humanities, Iranian Cultural Society of North Carolina, the Library Collections Horner Jarrahi Speaker Series, and the Countering um, Hate Initiative. Now I will hand it to our moderator of the day, Dr. Didem Havlioglu, my colleague from Duke University, Associate Professor of the Practice of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, to moderate today's panel, which is titled Religio-Political Dimensions of Desire in Modern Iran. Dear Didem, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claudia. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone uh, to today's session. And I want to start saying that I know very little what I'm doing right now. I hope, I mean, I mean the technology part, um, but um, I will do my best. Um, so as Claudia said, uh, I'm gonna collect your questions from the Q&A um, and probably um, Emma will help us uh, to collect those questions from the Facebook. So um, we have a very interesting panel today and panelists, and I want to start saying a few things about the speakers and uh, specifically um, a couple of them today, because uh, you'll hear two papers um, that have been awarded the Firdev C. Tuzi Award in Persian Literature and Culture. It's an annual prize awarded to the graduate students producing innovative research in the field of Persian studies. Uh, the award is made possible by a family of anonymous donors from the Iranian community in um, North Carolina. And it is presented by the University Libraries and the Persian Studies Program at the University uh, of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. The recipients of the awards are um, Maryam Zehtabi Sabeti Mukaddam, uh, she is a PhD candidate in comparative literature at University of Massachusetts Amherst um, and her paper today uh, titled Girls for Sale and award also for this pa paper Girls, uh, Girls for Sale, the Politics of Child Marriage in Iran. Uh, and second, uh, Nassim Basiri, a PhD student in Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies at Oregon, Oregon State University for the paper, The Politics of Love in Iran, Implications of Religious Hypocrisy of Clerics in the Form of Temporary Marriages. And Leila Zanuzi, a PhD candidate, I think she just defended, right? So in Global Studies, uh, University of Cal uh, California at Santa Barbara for the paper, Integration in Diaspora, a study of interracial partnerships in Iranian diasporic literature. Um, and Ehsan Shekhel, um, Shekhel Haram, a PhD candidate and teaching fellow, 
at the Department of Religious Studies at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, for the paper, Crumbling of Spatial Boundaries and the Collapse of the Intimate Domain in Farhadi's Cinema. So the last two papers were presented during the first panel of the symposium on September 5th. Uh, you could visit the, the Facebook page uh, of Persian Studies at UNC if you'd like to watch a recording of those papers. But today um, we will uh, listen to Mariam and Nassim's papers. Um, so I want to start with Mariam Zahdabi. Um, and again, her paper is titled Girls for Sale, The Politics of Child Marriage in Iran. Um, Mariam is a PhD candidate in comparative literature at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where she recently defended her dissertation on the representations of sex workers in Persian film and fiction um, from the constitutional revolution of early 20th century to the Islamic revolution of 1979. She's particularly interested in women, gender, and sexuality studies and the intersection of religion and feminism. Her works have appeared in the International Journal of Persian Literature and The Guardian, and her most recent article titled The Birth of a Character, The Prostitute and the Early Novels in 20th Century Iran is coming, upcoming with the Journal of Middle East Women Studies. So I'm going to turn to Mariam and to remind uh, everybody that uh, speakers are going to take 20 minutes each uh, so that we can have a we can have time for discussion. Maria? Thank you very much, Jidan. Um, let me start by thanking Claudia for organizing this fantastic conference, this fantastic symposium. And it's such a privilege for me to be here. Um, so here goes. My paper, as Didam says, um, is on the politics of child marriage in Iran. Uh, so when in March 2018, the report of the Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the Islamic Republic of Iran was submitted to, to the United Nations General Assembly, child marriage loomed as one of its main concerns. According to this report, which cites the United Nations Children's Fund, Children Fund as its source, each year in Iran, 17% of girls marry under the age of 18, and approximately 3% or 40,000 girls marry under the age of 15. The main caveat of the report, according to its own writers, which affects the accuracy of these figures, is the absence of data regarding unregistered marriages, which are in the estimate of both local and international authorities very high. As a result, these figures merely reflect a fraction of the early marriages taking place inside the country. The report censures Iran for not addressing the issue, which has been raised time and again by various human rights organizations, in particular, the Committee on the Rights of the Child, whose experts in 2016 warned Iran that child marriage was tantamount to, quote, sexual violence against children, unquote. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child defines a child as a person below the age of 18, unless the relevant laws recognize an earlier age of majority. Child marriage, therefore, refers to any formal marriage or informal union between a child under the age of 18 and an adult. UNICEF chooses to call the unions of this sort child marriage rather than early marriage to underline the fact that these marriages take place, quote, before the age of consent, and as such, uh, they are de facto forced marriages. Even where consent is given by the child, the intense pressure exerted by family and community members to adhere to social norms around marriage renders such um, consent meaningless, unquote. Coercion and economic exchange, then, are inextricably intertwined in the warps and wefts of child marriage, so much so that the Uni United Nations Trafficking Rapporteur recognizes the practice as a form of trafficking, and Sheila Jeffries, a feminist scholar and activist, in her influential book, The Industrial Vagina, The Political Economy of the Global Sex Trade, argues that it is a form of slavery, as it, quote, fits the definition of slavery in the slavery convention very well, since the child is completely within the control of her owner slash husband, unquote. Jeffries doesn't stop at drawing parallels between slavery and child marriage. She takes this analogy a step further and posits that child marriage as a form of servile marriage, together with temporary marriage, forced marriage, and the marriage of male-ordered brides, 
is akin to prostitution. Of course, she also contends that all patriarchal marriages contain elements of prostitution as they are founded upon the male sex right and the unchecked recourse of a husband to the wife's sexuality. But, but the resemblance between marriage and prostitution becomes even more remarkable in the case of these servile marriages I just mentioned before. I mean, I just mentioned, where women are, for economic reasons, made to pledge their sexual and reproductive body, as well as domestic labor, to a man. Child marriage, therefore, in this definition, is a form of forced or arranged marriage and is prostitution as it allows sexual access to a child, to a child bride as a result of an economic transaction. But using all of these terms, child marriage, early marriage, slavery, prostitution, trafficking, interchangeably, is problematic in the eyes of many critics, such as Anne Bonting, a professor of law and society at the University of York and a scholar who has done extensive research on the subject. Another critic more familiar with the Iranian context is Shamina Asghari, a, human, a humanitarian worker. These scholars problematize the concept of age and consent and postulate that equating early marriage in its entirety with forced marriage overlooks the complexity of early marriage by arbitrarily assuming an age below which individuals are considered as children and incompetent and incapable of giving their consent. Moreover, they argue, this misuse of terminology obfuscates the specificity of cultural and traditional practices and social, <clears throat> sorry, social norms while putting undue emphasis on the importance of legislation without push, pushing at the same time for the reform of cultural, socioeconomic, and educational infrastructure that should exist for such legislations to work. As Kari cautions that if the situation on the ground remains the same, raising the min minimum age of marriage in Iran, for example, will open a Pandora's box because these marriages will happen as frequently, but those who facilitate these marriages will find new methods to circumvent the law. I already mentioned the high number of marriages that remain unregistered in Iran because a child bride has not yet reached the age of marriage. The lack of registration itself is conducive to, in, to innumerable evils as a child bride will be easy prey for men whose children with these girls will not be even recognized by the law. Quite as prevalent is the practice of falsifying a girl's birth certificate so she would meet the minimum age of marriage, which is 13 in Iran. As Khari concludes, driving these marriages underground is not a solution. Laws are not the only medium of change, change, she argues. This conclusion is very similar to the one drawn by Jamshid Amoumeni in 1972. Speaking of the Pahlavi regime's recent legislations, increasing the age of marriage to 18 for girls, Moumeni explains that legislations alone could not eliminate child marriage as long as there are exemptions stipulated in the language of the law, and as long as the legal registration of marriages remain unenforceable. Tayyip Siyaboshi, an Iranian parliamentarian, reports that in the span of four years from 2012 to 2016, the rate of marriage of girls between the ages of 10 to 14 has fluctuated between 6.5% to 9.4% of all marriages registered in the country. Whether we concur with the international human rights perspective that marriage under the age of 18 precludes the consent of the girl, or with the more cultural relativist approaches that question the validity of a universal and artificial age of maturity and consent, the disturbing reality remains that early marriage, especially among the younger girls, brings about a host of undesirable consequences for the child right. Among them are, I quote, high rates of unintended pregnancy, abortion, preterm labor, delivery of low birth weight babies, and fetal and maternal mortality, with pregnancy-related deaths being the leading cause of mortality for girls between the ages of 15 to 19 worldwide." Unquote. These, were, the, these girls are susceptible to more physical and sexual violence perpetrated by their husbands, and upon the latter's death, divorce, or indisposition more prone to economic vulnerability as a result of their diminished employment opportunities caused by the lack of education and skills which the early marriage precipitated. The present project is started with this question that if both before and after the revolution we have been unsuccessful in eradicating child marriage, then where do we get to hear the stories of these child brides? If at least one in five women around us has had an early marriage, and almost half of these women married when they were 
hardly even 14, then where are they in the artistic and literary imagination of the Iranian people? Has their voicelessness, marginalization, and disenfranchisement translated into their invisibility in film and fiction? 20th century Persian literature abounds with short stories and novels that address different forms of servile marriage sanctioned in Shi'i faith. They problematize the Islamic discourse on the issue and liken traditional Islamic marriage to prostitution. Saleh Hedayat, Saleh Chubak, Muhammad Ali Jamal Zadeh, Ibrahim Golistan, as Claudia herself beautifully shows in her book, um, have drawn clear parallels between prostitution and sire. And ever since the first social novel in the country, which was Tehran and Mahou, published in 1924, both forced marriage and arranged marriages have come under attack by many writers and filmmakers, such as The Bride of Fire by Khosro Sinai. Child brides, child mothers crop up regularly in the literature preceding uh, the Islamic Revolution of 1979. They, however, hardly occupied a center stage in these stories. They form a backdrop against which socioeconomic conditions and cultural practices get criticized. Their story is hardly ever about them, their age at a time of marriage, or their feelings at a time of it. Child marriage in itself is almost never singled out to form the over overriding theme of of a piece. It has mostly been treated as one of the many abuses leveled against women and gets lost in a long list of evils perpetrated against them. Take Jamal Zadeh's Sheikh and Fahesha, Sheikh and Prostitute as a case in point. Speaking of the injustice and hardship of being a woman in Iran, the prostitute admonishes God, whom she believes is responsible for creating women unequally and thus sanctioning their unfair treatment through his commandments. She says, dear God, are we children, you, are we women, your children from a temporary marriage? Has a girl offended you that every pregnant woman continually prays for a child not to be a girl? Why are we paying a ransom for our weakness to the capricious nature every month in the form of monthly bleedings? Let's say our intelligence is really defective and our hair really long, whose fault is that? We are described as cunning and deceptive. Were we any of that, we wouldn't be so wretched. We are still dolls, Arusak, um, when we have to ourselves become brides. So I have to pause here for a second and uh, explain something for a non-Persian speaking audience. In Persian, in Persian um, the terms for doll and bride are very similar, basically the same term. And the term for Arusak, the term for doll, which is Arusak, has only one extra letter at the end. Okay, so please remember this distinction. Uh, doll is Arusak and uh, bride is Arus. So we are still dolls when we have to ourselves become brides and our mouths still smells of our mother's milk when we should nurse a baby. Which animal has to carry a baby for nine months and nurse them for a year or two? And then before we can catch a breath, we have to start all over again. Dear Lord, had you experienced being a woman? I seek refuge in Allah for saying that. You either would not have created them at all or would have created them in a way more fitting to your kindness and, just, and justice. So, the transition from being um, dolls or arusak to brides or arus happens in the span of a few words. With the omission of only one letter at the end, uh, the girl has become a woman, as simple, hasty, and superficial as that. The loss, however, as painfully and, in and intensely as it might have been experienced by the girl, is not elaborated and dissolved into a litany of other forms of horror committed against women. While that loss, that loss of one letter or that loss of girlhood, of childhood or of whatever that you know, letter stands for, according to Tajo Saltane, who was a Rajar princess living in the early 20th century Iran, can be the most important cause of a girl's unhappiness for life. She says, even now, 22 years after the event, I have not been able to keep myself from a nervous shiver as I write this. I had to put down my pen for an hour, sighing woefully in vain. In fact, what greater misery is there for a person to marry as a child at the age of eight? All my life, I have been miserable and bewildered, and all of it started on that cursed day. 
So um, it is important to note that I am not questioning the significance of Jamal Zadeh's story or trivializing other forms of misogyny that are practiced in Iran, but the treatment of this topic in this story is symptomatic of the treatment child marriage generally receives in our literature. Child brides are always there in the background, but child marriage is almost never expanded on. In these stories, the trauma is never center stage. The consummation of the forced marriage is only hinted at, and the thoughts and feelings of the child brides um, are never vocalized. Just like in life, she has little agency in art and literature. Ali Ashraf Darvishian's story, Heta, is a short story published in 1973, and Madian, which translates into Mayor by Ali Jacquin, is a movie um, that came out in 1986, are among the most notable but few examples of literary and artistic works that tackle the question of child marriage in Iran. Heta tells the story of his eponymous child protagonist who is given in marriage to the son of her father's creditor in exchange for the dissolution of his debts. Grim and devoid of any literary fl flourishes, stark, raw, and dark, Darvishian's story is short, simple, realistically narrated, and has a plight of the child bride as its main focus. The narrator forebodingly prepares the readers for the climax of the story, which is the rape of the child bride. To reflect the external world in which Heto and other girls like her are denied agency and a voice of their own, the narrator never quotes Heto. Her voice is decidedly absent from the narrative until the moment of her rape, upon which we hear her beseeching her husband to spare her. This is the only instance we get to hear her voice unmediated and unfiltered by the omniscient narrator, after which she never recovers from the physical assault. Um, the, the physical trauma of the sexual assault and dies in a matter of hours. Posthumously, she's pronounced to have been a doll and Arusak again by her father-in-law upon whose very insistence and instigation his son married Heto and committed the assault. This sudden realization that Heto was not fit to be a bride yet was not brought about by her age, small stature, or the fact that she was still in the habit of playing with her dolls. It is only through and because of her death that this marriage is now condemned. Had she survived the rape, we wouldn't even have heard her story. Darvishin has to go to such lengths to kill off the character to bring home the evils of child marriage to, to his readers. The exact opposite of this denouement is the final scene of Ali Jacquin's Maudian, which ends with a blissful moment of a child bride grinning from ear to ear as she's breastfeeding her newborn daughter. Her eyes sparkle with contentment while surrounded by her husband, who is as old as, as her late father, his first wife who is infertile and is acting as a, as a maid in her own house, his extended family all jubilant over, over the birth of an heir, and her own mother and uncle. The movie, however, has a lot more in common with Hita that we can glean from this ending. Like her, Godbute, the child bride, is a girl barely 13, and she's forced into marriage out of economic necessity. Acting as a go-between and out of self-serving desire for a profitable alliance, her uncle persuades Vodrak, the local shopkeeper, who has no children from his marriage of seven years to his first wife, to marry Godbute in exchange for a mayor. From this point onwards, the word mayor becomes used interchangeably to refer to both Godbute and the actual animal. This ambiguity and conflation of identities, if you will, uh, become even more striking when we see the girl is being described in terms we use for horses. Chamush, for example, or feral or wild is a term that we use in Persian for horses. And again, here is used to describe Godbute. Or people, men in the story speak of like uh, taming her with a whip. The act of marriage then, uh, didn't? Okay, all right, three minutes. The act of marriage then takes the form of swapping one mare for another. Godrat's family needs a mare whose only function is to bear children, and Godwita's family needs a mare to help make money. Interestingly, it is the uncle who assumes the ownership of both Godbute and the mayor. As the guardian of the family, after the death of Godbute's father, he beats her into submission to marry a man she professes to be scared of and is as old as her late father. 
Neither Golbute nor her mother, nor any other woman in the story is shown to be in charge of her own destiny. She merely changes hands from one man to another, with her consent being both irrelevant and unnecessary. This patriarchal supremacy is nowhere more apparent than in the scene where Godbute's wedding is being negotiated. Four men are sitting in a very dimly lit room and deciding her future with not one woman in sight. The all-encompassing darkness in this room signifies the gloomy future they are planning for her and also the fact that they are completely in the dark as to what her wishes her wishes regarding her future might be because not even once in the story in the film she's asked what she wants. Ironically, despite these all frequent, um, the, these frequent all male conferences, it is Golbuta herself who toward the end of the movie has a change of heart and insists on marrying Odrat. This reversal happens a day after her uncle severely beats her after her aborted attempt at running away from home. It is only upon the intervention of Odrat that the uncle stops uh, the beating. Hence, Rodrat becomes, becomes her savior, the only one who can stand up to her, to her abusive uncle and protect her. In this patriarchal system, where she finds herself destined to suffer male oppression in the form of physical, sexual, economic, emotional abuse, to remain silent, submissive, and subordinate, she takes refuge in another man who seems to be a lesser evil. When breaking out of the cycle of patriarchal domination and abuse is not an option, Swapping one male abuser for a seemingly less menacing one seems like a good choice, albeit a choiceless choice. Um, okay, I'll leave you with that because I'm running out of time. And uh, please remember that this is part of a much larger article, much bigger article, and uh, sorry, longer article. And um, I hope in the question and answer section we can talk about it more. Thank you so much, Mariam. I don't know why I cannot turn on my video. Maybe I'm not supposed to. Okay, just a second. All right, here we go. Thank you so much. You were just on time. Um, so um, I am going to introduce our second speaker right now, uh, Nassim Basiri. Uh, her, her, people, her paper titled The Politics of Love in, in Iran, Implications of Religious Hypocrisy of Clerics in the form of temporary marriage. Um, uh, and Nassim is an Iranian poet, uh, activist, and feminist researcher. Uh, currently, currently works as a graduate uh, teaching assistant and, and studies um, in uh, women, gender, and sexuality at Oregon State University. She's also a columnist uh, for the independent Persian who offers commentary and opinions on human rights and women's issues in Iran. Nassim? Uh, thank you for your kind introduction. And uh, I think uh, Mariam actually covered a big chunk of my paper, which, is, which I'm very happy about it. Uh, so I will skip that part. Uh, but I would like to thank uh, Dr. Claudia Yacobi for organizing such an important symposium. And uh, uh, I would like to emphasize, before I start, I would like to emphasize that temporary marriage in Iran is an issue that has not been the subject of much mutual research. So the resources currently available on temporary marriage is usually you know, kind of government supported or funded research that has always sought to legitimize this discriminatory law which favors religious men. Or the researchers has been forced to exercise extreme caution for the fear of being politically persecuted by a repressive religious government and sometimes making temporary marriage look positive as a way of threatening the foundation of the family and the future of Iranian youth. So as a result, due to the sensitivity of the issue of the state violence and the government's hostility towards academic spheres, research on temporary marriage in Iran suffers from the lack of neutrality and access to real data on this social dilemma. But thanks to a number of compassionate researchers and human rights activists in Iranian diaspora, such as Dr. Yakobi, uh, who were uh, able to provide us with some of the historical facts about discrimination and violence against women in post-revolutionary Iran and also prior to the Islamic Revolution. 
However, despite all these restrictions and government pressure on researchers and activists in the, in the field, and their efforts to silence research and civic activities and bring marriage, of course, remains as a well-known social justice issue for those who believe in human equality and human dignity. And the young generation of Iranian society have passed through these ideological filters and strongly opposed this law in various ways, as the sole purpose of which is to control the sexual relations of individuals and invade uh, their private spheres. And now they have defined and introduced their protests in the form of white marriages, uh, a protest that, as Master Rachel has pointed out, its vacancy as an alternative to this discriminatory law is strongly felt in academic research. So as we all know that the post-revolutionary era is considered as a controversial historical period, in contemporary Iranian history due to the fact that the 1979 Islamic Revolution opened a new chapter in Iranian citizens' life and especially women's life went through an unexpected transformation and a transformation that actually smells like betrayal, particularly because after decades of being in the forefront of the democratic struggles uh, in Pahlavi regime, they could change a considerable number of policies in favor of women. But in pre-revolutionary uh, uh, Iran, macro policies were enacted to reform the laws in favor of women and polygamy as well as, well as the temporary marriage was officially banned in 1956. So according to Yaqubi, to Claudia Yaqubi, after the revolution, Syria was encouraged by the state and the public focus of Friday prayers became a platform for, uh, from which clerics were, were able to encourage it. Sireh was presented as a sabab or heavenly reward and a means to prevent social and uh, sexual disorder. And Yakubi further argues that using the highly stigmatized costume of Sireh, the Islamic Republic attempted to pose sexuality and resolve the social and sexual disorder in the country under the facade of religion. But today, in the Islamic Republic, temporary marriage is perceived or introduced, actually, as a source of happiness for men and women. But, of course, uh, activists, the civic activists fears that this time the rulers will continue their patriarchal po policies through legalizing temporary marriage to implement further violence against uh, women. And of course, uh, I personally believe that they were kind of successful in doing that. Men uh, seem to be enslaved by the rebellious and uncontrollable demons of their sexual needs, and women are bored to sometimes reduce uh, the, and continue the male generation and uh, satisfy their sexual interests. Uh, most proponents of temporary marriage emphasize on the guilt of illegitimate sexual relations between men and women and suggest that the right path to worldly and otherworldly happiness is temporary marriage uh, and sometimes insists on the superiority of Syria over permanent marriage. But what are the consequences of temporary marriage for women? Of course, I'm not able to cover everything today with the 20 minutes that I have, but research shows that most of the women who got married temporarily experienced some damage in their lives. And most of them were divorced women who were actually dealing with problems such as addiction, betrayal of men, violence associated with early marriages uh, that uh, Mariam covered perfectly and other factors. Issues such as financial, emotional, and sexual needs are also among the areas of tendency for temporary marriage by these women. In the Islamic Republic, of course, labor market conditions do not allow women to work or they often work with very low salaries. And on the other hand, since these women do not have the skills to earn a living, the financial need becomes the most important reason for the temporary marriage. Among these women, some received help from the Relief Foundation or Committee Emdad in Persian, providing them with a little money 
which cannot actually cover this woman's expenses even for a day. So their problems are persisted and temporary marriage has become a source of income for many of these women. But due to the short duration of these marriages, their financial problems actually remain the same. So they're still in the same page. They still face the you know, financial problems in their lives. And the same thing goes on. Therefore, the only motive for temporary marriage of this group of women that I'm talking about is the economic factor. And they see this kind of marriage as a job. In fact, this is a consequence of the application of Islamic law in which no attention is paid to women's dignity and it causes a lot of harm to her. In her book on sexual politics in Iran, Janet Afari argues that in post-revolutionary Iran, due to unemployment, idealistic expectation about marriage being in the situation of inflation and other contributing factors, uh, actually led to an increase in prostitution, suicide, and addiction among young Iranian girls, and thousands of them ran away from home in hope of finding a compassionate marriage. But instead, they were left alone and joined the sex industry. And resultantly, prostitution became a regulated activity, and a quarter of those entering prostitution had contracted a temporary marriage. And of course, the Southern Parliament further uh, uh, facilitated uh, temporary ma marriage, uh, despite the harm it could cause to women, girls, and of course, boys, according to Afari. And then interestingly, Afari's research indicated that often government authorities themselves were the clients of prostitution, particularly those who were themselves the enforcers of morality regulations in the streets and directly benefited from the sex trade and legalized prostitution. Recently, uh, I also had several interviews with young women in the religious cities of Palm and Mashhad who work as sex workers. And all those women are in age group of 17 to 30 and temporary married to religious men and clerics living in Mashhad and home for hours, days, and sometimes weeks. So according to them, their customers are sometimes Iranian and foreign pilgrims from both countries and especially from Iraq. Some of them talked about being sexually abused by their intermediaries and how they should have sex with their intermediaries from time to time. Otherwise, they would not even answer their phone calls. The only reason these women turned into prostitution, according to them, was poverty and financial need. Some of them were divorced and had children. Some were undergraduate and graduate students. And uh, they were forced to choose Syria as a way of paying their university tuition and living expenses. And one was a high, high school student. Also, it is worthy to mention that all of them said they really prefer to have a significant other and to spend their time and life only with him. So Maya, for example, who is 27 years old university student said, I attempted suicide for more than six times, but each time I survived. She said, death is much better and more, more peaceful than living a life like mine. She said, my life is dependent on this dirty animal's money. They all said most of our customers who ask for see our religious authorities, clerics, uh, high-ranking clerics, and extremely religious men. Uh, one of those women who lives in Mashhad says she was beaten and choked by an Iraqi pilgrim for refusing to extend her sira but couldn't complain about it due to the fear of being known as a sira woman and being responded with far more judgment than compassion. <clears throat> uh, the other uh, consequence of uh, this phenomenon could be sexually transmitted diseases, which is very widespread uh, in Iran uh, and between the, you know, the sex workers of women who are uh, involved in uh, temporary marriage. Because sex education is not by thought by the media in Iran, people are usually unaware of their uh, sexual health, and uh, this is actually often exacerbated for low educated, you know, illiterate and poor women. In recent years, the Ministry of Health has provided education for those who are about to get married, but not for the women who 
are temporarily married or are going to be temporarily married. So they are at risk of sexually transmitted diseases while offer, uh, others have generally information about AIDS or hepatitis and do not know the ways of its transmission at all because <clears throat> they are, and also they are satisfied only with the physical health of the people they see. And some of these women, despite their desire, have deviated from sexual intercourse and were forced to endure its harm. In fact, in general, part of the violence that exists in this type of marriage against women is a type of sexual intercourse they have. And men who go for Syrian women think that by paying a dowry, they can make any unusual request of these women. Women are forced to accept it. Some of these women consider themselves religion, some non-religious, but, but none of them believe that the reason for this marriage to be rewarding and assume it is a way to meet their financial and sometimes emotional needs. So the more socially and economically disturbed women are, the higher prob probability of this happening. Uh, but what researchers are really doing about this uh, uh, you know, social justice issue? The book House on the, on the Water, which was recently published, is a study of Syria and Iran by Kamil Ahmadi. So through examining the laws and regulations related to marriage, divorce, and Syria in Iran and in Islam, Ahmadi's research provides the reader with the existing reality of Syria and its devastating consequences for women and Iranian society as a whole. But, you know, in fact, Ahmadi's research clearly indicates how implementing and legalizing Syria by clergies and the religious authorities uh, makes the society ill. But his book exceptionally rich in details of the terrifying consequences of Syria for women and Iranian youth in general uh, actually disappoints the reader with his recommendations later in the book. Particularly when insisting on the institutionalizing the temporary marriage, or as Mansoor Shujai points out, uh, the emphasis of Ahmadi is on institutionalizing temporary marriage instead of straining the alternative discourses in solving existing problems as opposed to building a brighter future for young people. In addition, in addition to mentioning the problems of Syria throughout Ahmadi's studies, the benefits of Syria are emphasized, provided that the institution of temporary marriage is empowered and organized. So one might perceive this kind of research as a way of legitimizing and normalizing the violence against women by male researchers in the absence of female researchers and writers who talk about their experiences and advocate for themselves. Or as Claudia Yagubi argues in her book, this inadequate representation might be because Syria has become a government and laws practice, which means that even if women or men, for that matter, write about Syria and its de detrimental impact on women, the work will be banned or subject to strict censorship. But my question is that, does it really work to include such harmful recommendations to bypass the censorship related to research publication in Iran, and how such recommendations will actually affect, or, uh, affect a century long women's struggles for their human rights and dignity that is buried under the dust of internal oppressions in Iran, as well as a global upper, apartheid that masks the violence and silences voices advocating by Iranian women's stolen rights. So here we see that, uh, that academia can actually uh, support the oppressive regimes in terms of implementing more discriminatory rules and regulations on women's law. So uh, we need to be very careful while researching issues 
related to women's rights or human rights, etc. So to end my presentation, I would like to invite the audience to think about the religious hypocrisy of clerics in the form of temporary marriage and how Iranian women's souls and bodies are being exploited for religious male sexual pleasure, mostly. Also, uh, I leave it to the audience, particularly to those who believe in temporary marriage as a solution to the Iranian society ill, to imagine themselves in the condition of those women, girls, and their children, and to rethink this solution, and to think about the question that how can a radical imagination actually support Ira Iranian women in their struggle for liberty, democracy, and dignity? Thank you. Thank you very much, Missy. It was right on time. And so I am going to move on to introduce our third speaker today, um, Mahdi Turaj and his paper, The Supreme Leader and I, Erotic Desire in Iranian Female Poets, Reading Their Poems for the Supreme Leader of Iran. Mahdi is, is currently an Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Social Justice uh, and Peace Studies at King's University College London, Ontario. He is the author of Rumi and the Hermeneutics of Eroticism and edited a volume, Esoteric Lacan, uh, with Philip Valentini. Uh, his publications have appeared in Comparative Studies of South Asia, Africa and the Middle East, Iranian Studies, and International Journal of Zizek Studies. His areas of interest are Islamic religious thought, Sufism, and postmodern theories of gender and sexuality. Mahdi? Hey, thank you very much. So my paper is an examination of erotic content of poetry performances in annual gatherings, in the presence of the Supreme Leader of the Islamic Republic of Iran, Ayatollah Khamenei, um, by selected female poets. I'm going to start with a bit of contrasting the overlooked, quote, conformist form of agency with the overvalued emancipatory model of agency. A well-known example of the emancip emancipatory model of agency is the critically acclaimed Azar Nafisi's 2003 memoir, Reading Lolita in Tehran, where she argues for exile as a, as a space most conducive to exercising one's agency. Because exile is the, in her words, with all quotations, inspirational, fulfilling, potent, and space of becoming. Now, this is writing memoir, moving to exile, or offering a fictional world where heroines struggle with oppression and impose despair are commendable strategies. But the subject's capacity to heroically transgress the norms is taken for granted and, presumed, and presumes that autonomous intentionality and freedom to act are universally available feasible and desirable for the oppressed subjects. The only thing they need is ways of in, um, evading impositions by external powers. Um, the background of this poet reading sessions has been examined by Dr. Fatima Shams, which actually her book came out just uh, yesterday. It's not even published yet. It's, um, it can be pre-ordered, A Revolution in Rhyme. She calls these, these, she finds the root, traces the roots of these poetry reading nights to court poetry, shared that body of pre-modern times. Many domineering fathers of totalitarian regimes often associate, associate themselves with young female lovers who symbolically stand for the nation they aim to protect and shape into their own vision. Mussolini, Stalin, Hitler, Mao Zedong, Kim Il-Yong, Gaddafi, Saddam Hussein, Radovan Karajik, and our own own boy Ayatollah Khomeini, you know, these are all examples of that. We, um, we find this in pop culture Hollywood trope of, quote, mixy, sorry, magic pixie dream girl who enlivens the life of a brooding old man. Uh, and there's tons of films and, present, and present representation of her out there. And we find it also in Persian literature. I think Dr. Kuli is one of those. And Islamic history as well. This magic pixie dream girl is like the 12-year-old Lolita, who um, Humbert Humbert, the middle-aged professor of literature in Nabokov's novel, tries to seduce. And this is the, precisely the parallel Nafi Sidras between Ayatollah Khomeini seducing young women of Iran into submission. We should note 
that these annual poetry reading nights are not subversive at all. They are carefully crafted to my to me. Poems recited in these events by female po poets range from satirical and didactic to nationalistic and mystical. I'm fo focusing on uh, one poem here by a young poet, Tayyip Abbasi, that, that, that centers desire while, uh, while looking at, um, you know, directly at, as leader. I'm going to share my, my screen so you could that. And here it goes. I think you should be, you are seeing this. This is one of the sessions. Come on, go ahead. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Mehraban tarin salam be mehraban tarin pedar. Ghazal ro taqrim huzur tu mi kona. Lawushit. اگرچه در شب دلتنگی من صبح آهی نیست ولی تا کوچه های شرقی الاف راهی نیست مرا اشراق رویت کافی است ای نور قدوسی که فیض دیگران چون شم گاهی هست گاهی نیست برای آن کسی که لای شبوها تو را می جست به غیر از متن خوشبوی شقایق جان پناهی نیست نظر بازی نباشد در مرام آشقان حیحات که چشمم بی تماشای تو در بند نگاهی نیست کجا باید تو را پیدا کنم هر جا که آهی هست کجا باید تو را پیدا کنم هر جا که راهی نیست آفرین آفرین خوب بود خوب بود سیار خوب خوب so um, I'm going to keep it here. Just uh, I think the phone microphone was on, but that's okay. Those are part of the bloopers, I guess. So uh, let me just say a few things about this before um, bringing before stop sharing my screen. That um, you know, the, as a translation, I have it there, you see it. It says, she says, even though there's no end to my lonely nights, the Eastern alleys of forgiveness are not too far off. The, the, the dawn of your face is enough for me, O sacred life, because others' blessings is inconsistent, like light of a candle. For the one seeking your, you among night-scented flowers, there's no shelter except the fragrance of puppies. Exchanging amorous glances, Nazar Bazi, is not the way of lovers. Far from it. My eyes are not attracted to anyone's glance, except beholding your pleasant sight. So two considerations are in order for understanding the significance of this poem. The first one is its context. The genealogy of this poem can be traced back to, a, to the panegyric poem composed in the pre-modern ruler's court, Madi genre, which were the center of literary life in pre-modern Islamic world. A Persian panegyric poem was often composed for a wealthy patron who paid the poet. In return, he would be praised with idealized, idealized description, which boosted his popularity and showcased the rhetorical skill of the, of the poet, a lot like the commissioned portrait of, portrait of the royalty in the Western art depicting the ruler as the perfect representative of the category to which he, he belonged. Importantly, the earlier panegyric poets were always male, in this, it is significant here that the case of above poem, in the case of above poem, this poem, the, the poet is female. The, uh, the anomalous gender of the poet in this poetry reading session can be explained by the paradoxical situation of women from religious sectors of Iranian society under Islamic Republic, where contrary to pre-revolutionary times, they are, they are expected to be 
publicly active citizen participating in politics, employment, education, paramilitary training, and reconstruction effort, as um, Professor Janet Afari has shown. The female poets participating in these poetry sessions probably gain the same, quote, sense of purpose in life and feeling of superiority to others that female supporters of Islamic Republic who joined revolutionary forces and war-related activities did. It is also plausible that beyond these measurable calculations of their, per, their own personal gain and notwithstanding ethical issues of contributing to the pre, uh, perpetuation of an oppressive state and obstructing, and obstructing other Iranian women's agential efforts and devaluing their grievances, their admiration and favorable desire for the leader is genuine and, and authentic. My point is that recognition of female poets' desire in, desires in these poetry readings is not contingent upon ostensive acts of transgression. The second consideration about this poem is its mystical quality, which is due to its roots in the Persian literary tradition for the creative assertion of agency and expression of desire under oppressive conditions. For example, consider uh, terminology that's used here, sacred light, nur qudsi, dawn, ishraq, candle, sham, and nazarbazi, which allow for the subtle expressions of love and desire by playing on the ambiguity of the established poetic conventions. The use of mystical metaphors locates this poem in the lineage of Sufi poetry, whereas the panegyric aspect of this poem concerns the idealized image of the supreme leader. Its mystical metaphor facilitates ambiguous poetics of desire. Candle, for example, has a long history of practical symbolic metaphoric use in Iranian social, religious, and mystical settings. Referring here to the uh, work of Dr. Sayyid, uh, Sayyid Qurab, Professor Sayyid Qurab. More importantly is Nazarbazi, the practice of contemplating the divine in creation by gazing at the form of beardless boys. Here, the female poet departs from the classical flirtatious, male-centered, hetero, and homoerotic glances of the passive female or a feminized adolescent boy in favor of her own authorial gaze at the sight of her male beloved, the supreme leader. In a departure from normative patriarchal relations of power and domination, she is the author of the gaze who objectifies the leader, both textually in the poem and in real life. You know, when you see she gaze looks at the, at the leader. Also, the noun noun compound nazarbazi can be broken into uh, its independent constituent, nazar and bazi, without syntactic or semantic impact on the verse. But if nazar and bazi are taken as independent nouns, the meaning of the last line changes to, quote, for those in love, mystical vision, nazar, is not a game, bazi. This change increases the significance of the poet's act of beholding her beloved and showcases her literary skills, I think. Just like pre-modern mystical poetry, where earthly metaphors were used to go beyond the mundane, here too, the force of the metaphor pushes the, pro the process of meaning production beyond the setup of the relationship between the young female poet and the supreme leader. The ambiguity of poems like this creates opening for the staging of desire that exceeds their seeming praise of the leader. The significance of this poetry reading continues to unfold afterwards. So the detail, let me go to the next one. Um, detailed description of some of these events in news items and blogs become even more important than the, than the events themselves. For example, the Supreme Leader's gesture of gifting his ring to some poets are particularly popularized. The female poets write in glowing terms about their experience of receiving his, his ring as a reward. When a female poet informs the leader in a private meeting that it is her birthday, the leader gifts her his own ring. This is an important gesture given the significance of saints' rings in, uh, in Shia context. I'm not going to go into that. Receiving the leader's ring becomes an important part of the prestige bestowed upon the female poet and other recipients, such as the family of martyrs and, um, and athletes. They are, in, they are interviewed and pictures of the rings are widely distributed and so on and so forth. In recent years, some women have started to request, request, even demand a ring from the leader, leading to comical situation. It is reported that once so many women in the gathering asked the leader for his ring that he somewhat annoyed, he said, I don't walk around with a pocket full of rings, you know. 
One young poet, Tayyip Abbasi, describes her meeting with the leader in glowing terms. Um, and she writes about, you know, the leader who I'm in love with, Rahbarika Ashikas Hassan. And how and how was uh, and how she was prevented to touch his cloak above, and the only thing that stopped her flowing tears was putting the leader's gift gifted ring on her eyes. Here, I'm trying to point out that the embodied dimension of this poetry reading sessions as well. So it's not just discursive. The regime the regimes carefully controlled gender, the space, clothing, seating arrangements, and sanitized language of love and desire aimed to produce this Foucauldian the docile bodies. The female poet stands for the complement, sorry, compliant body of the nation, sitting in submission to the leader and his projected grandeur of disembodied divinity. However, bodies are not simply passive templates for inscription of the culture. They are producers of signification as well. In this poetry reading session, female bodies inhabit public spaces in desiring ways and judging by the vulgar comments that they receive on social media, I don't recommend you actually read the comments on those videos that I just showed. They also, the, the women are not just desiring, but they're also desired. What I'm trying to point out with these examples is that, let me just stop sharing, is that, What I'm trying to point out with this example is that, um, is that the contour of any capacity to act according to one's best interest under oppressive circumstances are charted in negotiation with par parameters of power. In this case, this negotiation is facilitated by creative submission. Therefore, negotiating terms of agency at the nexus of desire and power cannot be limited to scripted ways that only recognize the subversive emancipatory forms. We should also distinguish sexual from erotic. The sexual is related to instinctual drives, biological functions and needs that are gratified. Um, and its transgressive possibilities are limited. On the other hand, poetry reading sessions with, with their writings about love, longing and yearning for touching and being touched by the leader and all that, the cokes or drinks and all that are erotic indulgences whose significance exceeds the disciplinary censorship of their setting. Their enti the entire poetry reading sessions are designed to exclude sexual tension from This perspective, when the female poets are positioned, from this perspective, when the female poets are positioned as submissive subjects addressing the supreme leader, desire expressed in their poetry exceeds its discursive construction and the regime's regulatory machination, which in psychoanalytical terms is theorized as jouissance, surplus of pleasure, that becomes more significant when oppressed. The female poets, paradoxically, take pleasure in the disavowal of their own displeasure, or put differently, assert their feminist agency in submission. This is not to say that they take pleasure in their own oppression, but that the discursive oppression, oppressions, operations of erotic desire in these poetry readings lead us to recognize alternative ways of asserting agency that may include the desire for submission to power and authority. My goal in contrasting these two forms of agency is not to accord a position of privilege to one or the other, rather to show that the intersection of power and desire in these poetry readings uh, complicates the notions of agency and privileging the transgressive voices. Neither the conformist nor revolutionary forms of agency are outside of impositions of power. My conclusion is that transgression cannot be the sole producer of agency or the only indication of it. In this context, agency is better conceptualized as capacity for action that specific relation of subordination creates and enables. This is not to dismiss the significance of resistance altogether, but to get away from the, quote, the coercive and regulatory consequence of insisting 
on a stable subject of feminism and a universal category of woman. No utopian space of exile can free the subject, but, uh, but just as no oppressive power can ent entirely erase resistance and agency. Therefore, concepts such as emancipation, resistance, agency, and conformity are highly unstable. This warrants questioning the status of exilic space as the paramount locus of quintessentially feminist intervention and sexuality as the sole mode of agential acts. And right on just about 20 minutes, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mahdi. Yes, you are right on time. And, and thank you, uh, everybody, uh, Mariam, Nassim, and Mahdi. Very interesting uh, papers. I'm sure we're going to receive uh, questions. Uh, we already started receiving them. Uh, I just wanted to start with, uh, I mean, lots of thoughts, um, of course, after uh, these, these interesting uh, papers. Uh, but Mahdi, your paper reminded me um, Shirin Nishat's um, short film, Turbulence, and where uh, the male and female um, uh, performers, um, you know, they, uh, they sound very different. Uh, if I understand correctly, I think she wanted to say that if a female poet or a singer tries to sing in the same convention, the poetic conventions or the musical conventions, she's going to be like, um, it's not going to be uh, under, understood in the same uh, audience. Uh, but so, um, but, but you say that established poetic conventions can be subverted and that's what may be um, a way of uh, resistance um, using the given conditions and maybe uh, resisting in that way. I wonder, um, uh, you know, in our cases, uh, other cases like Nassim and Mariam was talking about, uh, do we see uh, similar, you know, kinds of resistance in um, in the way um, you know women are subverting their situation? Um, um, not necessarily, you know, you see them like you know clearly resisting, but maybe using the given conditions and um, sort of um, changing the changing them towards their for their own uh, good. Do you see that, um, or is it really um, wishful thinking that we are doing here? We, you know, we can open up like if you want to pick. Uh, up from um, Mayam or uh, Nassim? Sure, so um, in the context of child marriage, I don't know how much that applies uh, because, well, of course, child marriage happens uh, between a girl at a very young age and with, you know, a much older man, so I don't know how that you know, dynamic can be subverted. But I can speak to like, other forms of like um, sex work because to me, child marriage is also a form of sex work because it, it has a transactional nature. And because I am a literary scholar, I can speak to that in literature. Um, well, we see that uh, when speaking of sex work in general toward the beginning of the century until the probably 1960s, uh, when no woman is writing about sex work in Iran, um, you see that men are using the same objectifying discourses still in their literature, okay, in the stories, even when they're championing the women's cause, they're using the same objectifying discourses or unobjectifying discourses. But when women start writing about the subject of sex work, uh, you suddenly see that they're not using, they're subverting those discourses. So it really is a thing that you can see, especially very um, prominently in the literature between how men write about sex work and how women write about sex work. So as a literary scholar, I can speak to that, but honestly, um, I cannot speak about child marriage in that context because, as I said, there are not many um, short stories or novels or even films about child marriage, so I cannot compare approaches to this uh, issue. Nassim, do you want to add something or should we just start picking up the questions? I just want to add, Mariam, I mean, it's a confirmation of um, Mary, what Mariam said because uh, like girl child, they don't have too much access to literature or they cannot produce their own literary uh, narrations. But we, 
of course, if you take a look at the literature produced by women, uh, you know, we will see that there are accounts on uh, child marriage as well as uh, temporary marriage. But of course, the first one came uh, from face Facebook for Mariam. Um, is child marriage um, is child marriage more prevalent in Shia areas compared to Sunni areas? Uh, thank you so much for that question. Before answering that question, I actually have to address something that Professor Afari uh, brought up. Um, I read the numbers in, refer in reverse when I was, uh, you know, speaking of the number, the figures about child marriage. So I should have said 4.9 to 6.7. Okay, so that's the number of child marriage registered child marriages that we have in Iran. So of course the number is much higher, but we don't have that actual number because they're not registered. So I had to correct that. Uh, thank you so much for bringing that up, Professor Afari. And um, so the question about uh, the prevalence of uh, child marriage in Xi or some um, regions, uh, there are actually a couple of places, a couple of provinces that these marriages are very prevalent in. So first of all, it is for Sada Razavi and then, you know, um, in different orders, we have Zanjan and we have Azerbaijan Shavi and Khuzestan. So these regions have both uh, Shi's and Sunnis. So it's very difficult to say, if, is it more prevalent among Shi's? Is it more prevalent among Sunnis? Because as I said, many of these mar marriages are not registered. Uh, but um, at the same time, the marriage of uh, the Sistan Balochistan, for example, it has the first, um, comes first when uh, speaking of uh, marriage of girls below the age of 10. And well, there are more um, Sunnis, right? It's a region for like, um, uh, sort of practitioners of the Sunni sex. So um, I'm not sure if I can really answer that question in terms of like, is it more prevalent between Sunnis or is it more prevalent between Shi's? Because uh, the sources that I have read do not quite address that issue. First, because the marriages are not registered. And second, because there are other things like tradition, honor, the concept of honor, uh, the concept of poverty, and you know, things like this they can address but religion does not honestly come into the picture in, in the sources that I have, you know, consulted. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question for Nassim. Um, aren't more women employed in Iran compared to other Middle East countries and temporary marriage is decreasing over the uh, last half century? Uh, well, uh, first of all, this, is a, this was a presentation about Iran of the other uh, Middle Eastern countries. Of course, the Iranian society and especially women are very progressive and uh, they could gain a lot of, uh, you know, uh, employment, uh, literacy and everything over the, you know, last decades. And, uh, but uh, of course, the, the rate of uh, temporary marriage is not, decreasing, it has increased uh, in post-revolutionary Iran. And uh, the, the reason that the, the problem is that we don't have real data on uh, temporary marriage in Iran because people prefer to do it uh, in secret, you know, uh, as it is known or perceived as something that uh, that is not good, you know, even though uh, religious authorities try to put a, uh, you know, try to advertise it as something good, as a solution to the social ill. But in fact, the culture and the Iranian society uh, does not accept it. And there's a lot of resistance going on. So uh, we, one cannot tell, I just said that in the beginning of my uh, presentation that we, the, the, the research on temporary marriage actually suffers from the lack of uh, mutuality. Most of the research is biased, the data is not accurate. So uh, that is the problem with the you know, research on temporary marriage in Iran, especially in post-revolutionary Iran. Thank you. Um, so I We'll read two questions for Mahdi. Um, so, you know, I mean, we can just, you know, line them up. The first one is, um, 
What's the difference between sexual and erotic again? So is erotic more socially accepted than sexual? So this is the first one. And the second one is uh, regarding your relationship between Jossans and Latch. I am wondering, says Ehsan, uh, how the transference of desire to a saintly figure might be a reconfiguration of the relationship between the lack and the object cause of desire. In other words, can we see the impossibility of having the object as a sustained lack, which then projects itself onto the empty signifier that is the figure of the saint? Yeah, well, wish me luck even understanding that. But let me let me see. Let me do my best. These are all. These are really really good questions. Like one of those that you know you need to kind of sit down and pull the rest of hair that I have out in order to understand. But the difference between say, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I could re relate both of them together. The, um, the difference between sexual and erotic, it's, it's uh, you know, that makes all the difference. So sexual is, is about gratification, about need, and, and it can be consummated, it can, it can subside and taken care of basically. Whereas erotic is very different. Erotic is about deferral consummation consummation in a sexual sense never takes place. And that's why the, the more it, it keeps going and it keeps get, getting uh, stronger um, and it's related to desire. Yeah, sometimes this connection is very right? so mm. We can't hear you, Matthew. It looks like everybody froze. I know you were. <laughs> oh, you guys froze, but that's okay. So I had an example in my paper. I can send it to you. Paper is done. Hopefully, when it is gonna, if it's accepted or not. But that's a different story. But paper is done. I have an example of sexual. For example, is uh, in the paper of um, you know the avant-garde feminist poet of uh, of Iran, Furuk Farukhzad. Gonai kardam, gonai kardam, gonai pur zelazad daraghushik gar maatashim bud. I I I I uh, committed a sin in a fiery embrace and everybody knows this is about this is about um, uh, an affair with a married man and that's now what I'm what I problem pro, have a problem with that or how I problemize it is that this is sexuality is not erotic you know exactly where the parameters are and you know exactly how who was it consummated with and the, the, the limits of its transgression is very evident could it, you, it has to be with a, with, a, with, a, with a married man. What if, what, if I, what if I told you, what if we assume that Furu's poem is about sexual relation with his, is about rape or incest or incest rape with, his, with her own step, stepson, which culturally and religiously acceptable in Iran because, it's because they're not related to each other. So you see it is, it, their sexuality has a lot of limitations whereas erotic does not. Erotic keeps going. And that's why when you, that's why back to what Ehsan was saying, let me see if I, I could do the best that I can answer that under, you know, circumstances, is that um, when, the, when the erotic is, when the, when the leader is eroticized, when the rahbar is eroticized, it's not about rahbar. It is about Rahbar, but at the same time, it is not about Rahbar. It's about Rahbar because it is so carefully engineered that meeting that you cannot, talk, you cannot say anything that is controversial or sexualized or, you know, from the setting and dress and words and all of this. However, using uh, um, classical Persian poetry, mystical poetry especially, it, uh, it, it, it exceeds the figure of Rahbar, the saintly figure of Rahbar. So the connection with the lack is there as well. Lack is, is you know, is the, is the driving force of desire. Let me just stop there and because if I, if I don't control myself, I keep going on. Okay, so um, I, I'll try to pick some questions um, and, you know, uh, for everybody. So there is a provocation here. So I want to read to Nesleem. Um So I, I quote, I think she was quoting you you know, you said, apparently, I don't remember this, they do not have access to produce their own, question mark, question mark. So the question uh, then, I believe it has not always been the unprivileged class to document their sufferings in literature, 
Also in your lecture, you mentioned that are the temporary marriage workers are satisfying their financial and emotional desires. Can you elaborate more on emotional? Yeah, that, that, that is also a reality because uh, to build my, the, my focus of my paper was on the sex workers. Uh, uh, but in general, uh, like I also mentioned that some of them, they do it for their emotional, some women, I'm not particularly talking about the sex workers, but you know, there are other groups of women in Iran that uh, they do that for the pleasure of sex. So uh, it's not only for financial, for, the, for their financial problems. And uh, I come from the south of Iran and uh, I lived in Iran till I was 20 years old. Uh, and I personally saw that, you know, a lot of, you know, high school girls and very young uh, women in our neighborhood, they went for Sira because uh, they were alone or, you know, they, you know, the tradition and the culture did not allow that. Also the politics because of the political pressure and, you know, uh, controlling uh, sexual um, uh, relationships of the citizens, not just in the South, but also elsewhere in, the, in Iran, they were forced to do that. Divorced women were forced to do that, to go to, uh, uh, to be a Sira woman, not, finan not merely because of, uh, you know, it's financial uh, uh, thing, but also for their own, because they are human beings. And once a government restricts even human interactions, human re relationship, your sexual life, then of course, uh, a, a lot of non-religious men and women go for that, not to be arrested, not to go to jail, and many other factors that contribute to that. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to read. Um, I'm going to read Professor Afri's uh, comments uh, here in the questions. Um, uh, section. Um, she says, uh, as uh, she shows in her sexual politics book, this type of agency that Mehdi was talking about uh, is openly uh, not subversive and works from the, within the system, can be extremely empowering to the individual women who express it. Such women are rewarded not just by rings, but power and position. The problem is that the patriarchal system uses them to further tighten its grip by claiming that it has women's backing. See, for example, how today in the US, the new nominee for the Supreme Court by Trump is a mother of seven children and firm opponent of abor abortion who lacks the experience of becoming a judge on the Supreme Court and yet here she is about to be confirmed. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good point. And again, I, I, have, I have noted that in my paper, specifically referring to the work of Sabah Mahmoud, who, keep, who you know, his, her anthrop anthropological work that, that talked about, you know, um, the agency of, of uh, women, religious movement in the mosque in Egypt, and, it ha and the criticism of that model of agency. So yes, we should be aware of it. Uh, there is an ethical problem with supporting the regime. So they don't, they don't just, it's not just desire. These are not innocent uh, gestures. These are not just innocent poetry. They are, they are um, hampering the, the works of, you know, liberation and other forms of agency. What is, what I wanted to take at the end, to, the point that I wanted to drive home at the end is that um, hopefully, inshallah, fingers crossed, there will be a revolution. He's gonna come back. No? Okay, I think he was done, right? <laughs> um, Me or not? Okay. No? Yay, <laughs> okay, so it looks like it's going, all right. So the, the, uh, what I wanted to point out with this, with this problem, pro ethical question of agency is that just, uh, I don't know if you got that part or not, or maybe that's the, the, 
wishful thinking for a revolution tomorrow in Iran is what disconnects this. But anyways, if tomorrow a revolution happened in Iran, what are you going to do with, the, with these women? What about, what about, what, well, is this, this is, this is the question that was not developed, was not um, in, in uh, you know, in 1979 revolution. Uh, well, just because you're a supporter of regime, does, you know, it does not mean that your work does not have literary value. Just because you are standing in the way of liberation of other women by supporting the regime and benefiting from it, from it, does, you know, um, um, does not mean that, or does it or does not? That, this is the question I'm asking. I'm not saying it does not mean, or it does mean. It does not mean that you have, um, that, um, uh, that, you know, it could be dismissed. So to, uh, in terms of approaching the, uh, the question of agency, approaching the um, type of literature that, that's produced in Iran. So, I hope that answers it. In my paper, I developed that basically, that, uh, that there is a problem with this sort of um, agency. And the problem has been pointed out in the work of people. Okay, thank you so much, Mehdi. Uh, so here's another one for everybody by uh, Behroz Parhami. Um, let's see. Um, I'm just going to read the last one because we don't have so much time. Um, I mean, and here is it. I don't believe any of the speakers today or earlier panels discussed the relationship between love, sex, desire, the topic of the seminar with violence against women. Can any of the speakers comment on this connection? Um, I would love to ask that question. Actually, um, I think um, in parts of my paper I did talk about violence against women, the fact that it is considered to be slavery, um, child marriage is considered to be slavery, that it is um, when a, a child bride's husband dies or she's divorced or um, the man cannot work, she is actually uh, quite prone to violence, not just sexual violence, she's prone to sexual violence within the marriage, but even if she works, she wants to work um, for to earn her own bread, she cannot do that because uh, first of all, she's not educated. I was reading an article in um, Sharvand actually, and it said that uh, in one of the villages that is not actually very remote in Iran, it's pretty close to Khoi, and in this village, every single girl has to get married before the age of um, ten or eleven before she gra graduates from elementary school because there are no secondary schools. They're, they're not, there's nothing else, there are no high schools. So if a girl wants to continue her education, she has to go to another village to actually, or to, to the nearest city or town to uh, get educated. These are all you know, manifestations of violence. It's not sexual violence, it's not physical violence, but it is a kind of violence because you're depriving a person from her, her rights uh, to uh, the most basic thing, that is education rights, but you are leaving the person with no other choice. That's why I, ended my paper with saying that it is a choiceless choice because you're leaving that person with nothing else to do. And um, to me, that's, that's violence. Right. Um, it's, uh, yes, I mean, really there are like physical and other source of violence and, um, and we're talking about children, so. And I'm, not, I'm not saying that there's not physical violence. Absolutely, there is a lot of physical violence and sexual violence involved and that's why I chose that story. That, um, you know, the climax of the story is rape because that happens quite a lot, but also other forms of violence. Yeah, right. Um, so it's 1.30, uh, uh, there's one more question left. Are, are you okay? Uh, we're going to address that one. Uh, for Nassim, uh, are temporary marriages legally registered? I can't hear you. Sorry, I didn't get you as well. Uh, so the question is, are temporary marriages legally registered? Well, it is not like, it's not, it is legal, it is kind of, uh, you know, it's like a contract that is not regis like registered that, uh, like similar to women in um, permanent marriage or, you know, it's not similar. It's like just a piece of paper that you can, you know, you go to, you know, the clergy or to the offices and you write it and the woman keep it with herself. So the, the women uh, who are uh, 
in temporary marriage, they don't actually have the rights of uh, those who are in uh, permanent marriage. And I talked about it as, uh, in the uh, in the paper, uh, and this is something that actually I am developing, uh, that, you know, even sh the woman was choked, the woman was uh, abused, the woman, you know, was abused to an extent that she killed herself six times, but she couldn't go to police. She couldn't even talk about it, you know, in the society because, you know, they, they re-victimize you actually as a, uh, as a woman in temporary marriage. If you go to police uh, the, to talk about, you know, your experiences associated with violence or sexual violence of the partner, nobody pays attention to these women. Actually, they call them, you know, prostitutes, a woman that lost her virginity. Uh, and of course, you know, those authorities, as Janet Afari uh, argued in her book, Sexual Politics in Iran, they take advantage of those, uh, you know, that this rule, uh, this law, and a lot of them were arrested, um, like a lot of newspapers wrote about them, but that's only for w other women, not for their family or sisters. It is a big, big stigma. Yeah. So that paper doesn't work anything. It's not like a real tempor uh, permanent marriage paper that you can actually uh, seek legal, uh, uh, sorry, like advocacy or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so I, I missed one question uh, again back from Bahrus Parhami. Parhami. Um, until a couple of decades ago, sex was considered a dirty word in Persian, which must not be uttered aloud. Uh, recently, I've noticed that Iranian clerics in their talk a lot more. I'm sorry, I'm like there's noise coming. Are you hearing me all right? Okay. Um, in their sermons talk a lot more openly about sex. Of course, both child marriages and temporary marriages have no other purpose than sex. What has emboldened the religious establishment to abandon their previous condemnation of sex other than for procreation? Um, I'll ask that question very briefly because for some reason my neighbor has decided to do something in the backyard and is making a lot of noises. So before it starts again, um, I would argue that child marriage is still for procreation. It's not merely for sex because uh, one of the things that is very, um, um, is considered a plus for men in a child marriage is the fact that the girl has so many years ahead of, it, ahead of her for procreation. If you get married at the age of 20, I don't know, 26, 25 or something like that, you have, a, well, you have a letter, lesser actually, um, not the fact that you cannot um, have children at that age, but at the same time, you might be um, working. You might have other things going on for you, but a child does not have any of those things, right? So the only thing that she has is procreation, right? And I would argue that it is still happening for procreation, but I believe uh, I will leave um, that question to Nassim because temporary marriage is not obviously for procreation. So she might be able to answer it in a better way. Um, oh, am I okay. I think uh, Mr. Parami raised a very important and interesting question that sex was considered a dirty word in Persian, and uh, especially by the clerics, and now they're using it again. Well, if you look at the history of you know Iranian revolution, uh, we would see that. Uh, even before the revolution, these clerics, you know, when they were preparing and organizing for the revolution, they were always condemning that regime as a, you know, Mufsad or a corrupted regime that uh, uh, invites the youth to have sex, to have illegal sex. And uh, then, 
when they then they you know they use women as a way of you know as a force of you know involving in revolution and in the revolution and then when the revolution happened the women were betrayed by by clerics and actually Mary's car uh, puts it in a very good way she says that uh women were always oppressed uh, by the clerics except for in one case and there was an exception and that was using women uh, as revolutionary forces in the revolution like to win the islamic revolution and when that happened they started you know uh, exploiting women and this time by putting a you know legal hat on the head of the issue of khudai shari whatever and then uh, you know they went for that and they they have their own way of you know advertising uh, sex or having sex but of course it should be in an islamic framework and then you know they are kind of trying to update themselves the world is developing they have to uh, you know think about their kind of uh, international affairs international reputation and uh, kind of showcase how uh, iranian uh, clerics iranian mullahs are very progressive they are good they don't have any problems they are uh, you know uh, not using organized uh, organized islam or political islam actually it's a, a religion it's a kind of islam that respects people's sexuality and sexual needs so it's populism Thank you so much everybody we uh, covered all questions and it was a very interesting discussion um so uh we are 10 minutes after 1:30 so i think it's good um i'm just going to close this panel right now and but before we do that before you leave i want to remind you that the wrapping up panel uh, of this symposium is going to be next week at the same time so don't forget to come for that one as well. That's all for today. Thank you for the presenters and thank you for the attendees. Uh, have a wonderful rest of the weekend.